There we go. Okay. Yeah, I'm fine. Like, I'll go back to. Um... Okay, I'd like to get the seminar started and I'm pleased to say that today we have Sarah Hobby here from the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Behavior. Uh, I'm going to read off the abstract because I think that it's very interesting what she's going to talk about. I'd like everybody to, if you hadn't read the abstract, you'll know now what it's going to be about. So she's going to describe the new Minneapolis St. Paul metropolitan area urban long term ecological research program in which researchers and community partners are working together to understand how climate change, pollution, invasive species, and habitat loss affect people, pollinators, forests, and water across the metropolitan area. The program asks, what is urban nature and how do people experience the benefits and burdens of nature differently across the Twin Cities? Ultimately, we aim to support decisions that improve environmental outcomes for all residents and to address racial and social economic disparities in environmental policies and practices. The project includes 30 plus researchers, educators, and community organizers from the University of Minnesota, University of St. Thomas, U.S. Forest Service, the Nature Conservancy, and the Water Bar. Funding comes from a six-year, $7.1 million renewable grant from the National Science Foundation, which supports postdocs, students, and staff in research, education, and engagement. Sarah. Um, so can someone online uh, maybe put in the chat, can you hear us OK now? OK, great. Thank you. Um, then I. Uh, Okay, so thanks for coming um, and giving me a chance to tell you a little bit about this project. So this is a brand new project. So this is a different kind of talk than I normally give. I won't be giving you a lot of results. I'm going to actually just be telling you more about what we hope to do, um, our, our hopes and dreams. Um, and um, I just would invite you to think about whether there are ways that you are would be interested in interacting with our project or ways that we might be able to help you in what you're doing. Um, so you can kind of keep that in mind as we go along. So um, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, um, this project is part of a network of sites that are part of the US Long-Term Ecological Research Program. Um, and this is a program that's funded by NSF. Um, there are 28 sites in the network and they range all the way from the Arctic Ocean to Antarctica with tropical temperate sites in between. There are terrestrial sites, marine sites, there are coastal sites, there are open ocean sites. Um, so it's a diverse network and it was started back in the late 70s, early 80s, when the NSF um, recognized that it's difficult to study ecological processes over the time span of a three-year grant, and that a lot of these processes play out over longer time scales. And so these grants are on a six-year funding cycle, and there's a possibility to renew. Um, and so there are now three um, urban LTER sites. So uh, one in central Arizona, Phoenix, uh, one in Baltimore. And unfortunately for the Baltimore site, they did not get renewed the last round in, of funding. And so that's when NSF put out a call for a new urban site that we competed for. Um, so we have this new site now in the Twin Cities. Um, and as John mentioned, um, it's a six year grant. Um, we do have the possibility to apply for renewal funding after six years, and it's a $7.1 million grant, mostly to the University of Minnesota, but um, just some other institutions as well. Um, so I just want to talk about why we think that this metro area is um, a, a good place to have a new urban long-term ecological research site. Um, and so we have a number of challenges and also opportunities here. So some of the challenges include um, persistent environmental problems. And since you are all WRS students, I think that you're 
aware of some of these. Um, and also persistent racial and socioeconomic disparities, um, including who benefits from um, urban nature. So this is just an example of some of these persistent environmental problems. So this is a map showing um, lakes that are impaired in red and non-impaired in blue um, as defined by the Pollution Control Agency. And it also is showing impaired streams and non-impaired streams. Um, and the main takeaway from this is that, you know, we've just invested millions of dollars into improving water quality in the Metro. And yet we still have a high number of impaired water bodies. Uh, this is an example of some of the racial disparities that exist related to the environment. So this just shows a map of Minneapolis. And on the left, we're showing the percent non-white population. Um, so darker colors represent higher non-white population. And then on the right, we have a graph of uh, temperature. And so you can see that, um, and then there's a, a scatter plot inset. So you can see that areas that are um, where we have a lot of people of color are experiencing, experiencing hotter temperatures than areas that are, are whiter. So in addition to challenges, we have a number of opportunities um, in the Twin Cities. So this is a region in transition, um, both social transition and also biophysical transition. So just to put us in context, you know, here we sit in Minnesota and, you know, we think of this, you know, we have a fairly flat landscape, but nonetheless, we have fairly steep environmental gradients. And so, you know, as you know, we have increasing precipitation as we move from uh, west to east, as well as increasing temperature as we move from north to south. And so at the, in the Twin Cities, we're sitting right at this intersection of three of the major continental biomes, the coniferous forest or the boreal forest in the north, the deciduous temperate forest in the east, and then what used to be prairie grassland and is now agriculture in the west. And so the Twin Cities metro reflects that. And if we look at the land cover map that we see more forested lands um, to the north and more agricultural lands to the south and to the um, west. And so we might expect that as we experience environmental changes in this region and climate change in particular, that we would see changes in and transitions in uh, things like uh, land cover. Um, we're also experiencing um, rapid climate change in this region. Um, so this is just one example of projections for precipitation and temperature where we have the expected percent increase in June precipitation from 1990 to 2050. Um, on the left and the, per, the projected increase in days with highs over 90 degrees Fahrenheit um, on the right. And along with the increases in precipitation, you all know that we're um, experiencing and are expected to continue to experience more intense precipitation um, events. Um, so in addition, we have this opportunity that's set up by the fact that we have so many water bodies. And so, that um, gives an opportunity for comparative study across um, lakes and streams, um, across watersheds. Um, and so just as an example, um, this map shows um, lakes that are experiencing trends that show degrading water quality in red, um, no change in water quality in orange, and improving water quality in blue over the period from 1972 to 2019. So of course this then begs the question, like why do we see this variation? Why do we see that some lakes are not changing in terms of uh, water quality? Why are some improving and why are some degrading? What are all the factors that are contributing to this? So um, having so many different lakes that we can compare then allows us to try to tease apart things like management versus climate versus you know, lake characteristics um, versus other factors. Um, we also have replication at the level of governance. And so the Twin Cities are unique in, they, in that they have very complicated governance, um, both in terms of governance kind of across spatial scales, but also in terms of the number of government entities that we have in the Twin Cities. So 
you know, we think of the twin cities as these two cities, but actually we have over a hundred cities that have populations greater than a thousand. We have seven counties and we have 33 watershed based governing entities. So watershed management organization and watershed districts in just in the seven county um, metro area. And so again, this sets up an opportunity for comparative work across these different governance entities. Um, so this just shows, you know, all of our cities, our counties, our watershed management entities. And then of course we have the Met Council that is governing at the scale of the entire metro region. We also have abundant long-term data that's being collected by many of these entities. So these watershed based governing entities by parks, by cities, by Met Council, by counties. Um, so there's a rich set of data but it, it hasn't necessarily in, in many cases been integrated so that it can be, um, so that you can work with it all together and do the kind of comparative work that, um, that I was referring to previously. And then we have a lot of ongoing research um, in the urban setting. So the time was kind of ripe, I think, for us to put in this proposal because we've got work that's going on across the university um, related to the urban system. So who we are, so John already mentioned, we have 30 senior personnel on the grant. We're up to about 60 people that are involved with including graduate students and postdocs and staff and um, collaborators. Um, John already mentioned the organizations that are involved, uh, but I'll just mention that we're coming from quite a diversity of disciplines um, from the biophysical sciences, to the social sciences. And I would mention that we have a, a pretty large social science component um, to the project. So our focus is really on interactions between people and nature in the cities. And we're defining nature quite broadly um, to basically encompass all of the green and blue space that we have in the city. But we're also interested in learning how different communities of people define urban nature. So that's part of the research. Um, this is kind of a conceptual model for our work. So our overall goal is to understand these relationships between urban nature and people in the city, both to understand how urban ecosystems are responding to these rapid environmental changes and social changes that I mentioned, um, and also ultimately to inform approaches for addressing inequities and improving environmental outcomes um, for di diverse groups of people living in the city. And we're uh, asking this question at scales, um, at, at increasing scales in both the, the natural system as well as the social system. So we're looking across scales from organisms to habitat patches, to drainage networks, to landscapes, as well as from individuals to groups, to municipalities, to the entire metro region. And so we're, we have kind of four organizing questions and then a number of sub questions within those. So I'm going to kind of walk you through the questions that we're addressing. And in a few cases, I'll be able to give you some early results, um, but mostly just talk about, um, you know, the kinds of questions that we're interested in addressing and, and a little bit about the approaches that we're taking. So we have a number of questions focused on terrestrial habits, particularly pollinators and forests. Um, we have questions related to aquatic habitats, watersheds, lakes, and streams. Um, we have questions related to decision-making, both about investments in urban nature, as well as governance and advocacy. And then sort of overarching uh, throughout the whole project where we have questions related to inclusive community engaged research. So what I wanna do now is kind of walk through each of those questions. So as far as terrestrial habitats, um, We've got several different questions. Um, so one set of questions um, is focused on understanding the ecological impacts of urban contaminants. And the co-leads for this team are Emily Snellrud and Nick Jelinski. Um, and in this work, we're trying to understand the influence of contaminants, including heavy metals, salts, and nutrients on organisms to try to understand why some organisms are more tolerant of some of these contaminants, particularly the heavy metals than others. Um, and also to, under, to find ways to use um, ecological communities to actually 
try to manage some of these contaminants and reduce the risk of human exposure um, to heavy metals and soils. And so a large component of this is actually um, creating maps of um, some of these um, contaminants such as lead. And so this is uh, just an example of some of the variability that we see in lead across the Twin Cities. Um, this is showing um, published data. So this is not work that we've done, but this is what we're building off of. Um, so this shows blood lead levels, which are correlated with soil lead levels. Um, and you can see some of the variations. So these are just three different parks with the mean and the maximum lead levels measured. Um, and so we're really interested in how um, different ecological communities, so like turf grass lawns versus some of these pollinator plantings um, differ in how they influence the distribution of um, lead throughout the soil profile because of their effects on um, organisms such as earthworms, um, as well as trying to understand why some of the insects that um, are utilizing these plants differ in their tolerance to some of these contaminants. We have another set of questions focused on understanding the resilience of the urban tree canopy. And so we're interested in how management, climate change and pests and disease, so things like emerald ash borer and oak wilt interact to affect the diversity of the urban tree canopy and how biodiversity in turn influences the resilience of the canopy in the face of um, extreme events and how the benefits of the urban tree canopy are distributed across different people, as well as the burdens of, of the urban tree canopy. Um, so just to give you some sort of examples of what we're doing in this uh, for this question, um, I showed you this graph previously that shows um, the percent non-white population uh, distribution in Minneapolis. Um, this is showing then tree cover tree canopy cover in um, Minneapolis. And you can see that as in many cities, there is a relationship between um, race and tree canopy cover where people of color are have lower tree canopy cover in their neighborhoods than white people. Um, and so this has been shown in a number of different cities now. Um, what we're really interested in doing is unpacking that tree canopy to ask questions about the diversity of the urban tree canopy cover. And the reason that we're interested in that is because work in non-urban systems has shown that more diverse systems, more diverse ecological communities are more resilient. They can bounce back following extreme events or stressors um, more so than low diversity communities. And so this is what we hypothesize we might see if we look at the relationship between the urban tree canopy um, diversity and resilience, where high diversity um, urban forests would have higher resilience um, following extreme events um, or other stressors um, compared to low diversity um, urban forests. And furthermore, that we would see more diverse tree canopy in white wealthy neighborhoods um, compared to poor neighborhoods of color. And so the way that we're going about um, addressing this, this is gonna require that we measure the diversity and canopy cover over long periods of time. And so we hope to do that using remote sensing techniques. Um, so this is work that Janine Cavender Bears and Joe Knight are leading. And I don't know, I better look at this chat because they might be saying something. Oh, never mind. okay. Um, so we're taking advantage of the fact that Species, plant species have unique reflectance spectra. Um, so they reflect incoming solar radiation differently, um, which makes them potentially identifiable from um, high resolution hyperspectral satellite imagery. Um, and so we're hoping to use ultimately to use satellite data to be able to identify individual tree species. So this is kind of the, our holy grail or what we're, what we're hoping that we can do. In order to be able to do that, we have to actually develop empirical models that um, allow us to identify species from space. Um, and so uh, towards that end, what we're doing is, uh -oh. oh, I'm not in my, there we go. 
Um, we are uh, pulling together um, inventory data from across the Twin Cities Metro. So, so far we've gathered data from 34 tree inventories that have been uh, inventories of street trees that are done by um, individual cities. So this is an example of the, where we have this super rich data set in the Twin Cities where all these municipalities have collected, have done tree inventories, but they're not talking to one another, right? And so that's, those are disparate data sets. And so we're trying to pull those data together so that we can use them ultimately to train these models to allow us to identify um, tree species from space and look at these relationships between diversity and resilience. We had a question on yeah. this slide. If you look at the areas which have a high concentration of BIPOC residents, they don't even have data. Right, and so one of the things that we're interested in doing besides using these data to just train these models is to actually look at these data as a measure of investment in the urban tree, urban forest, um, both to look for relationships, um, like do we see relationships even between diversity and socioeconomic factors using these data, but also as you point out, Dave, just the fact that there are data is a, is a measure of investment in the urban forest. Yeah. Um, I'm involved with the Breck Woods. Is yeah, there, yeah, yeah. Do you know that there's a inventory of the Breck Woods? I will have to make sure that we know that because, because it's private for a developer right. a neighborhood group that was shared with us and whether it's but you definitely know it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. We're so we're constantly trying to pull together data sources. So that's super helpful. And I have the contact folks for that. So I will Great. make sure that we get that. Thanks. Yeah. What is the resolution of the satellite um, data that you get back? Is it like the satellite? Yeah, it's really high resolution, like like a meter. Um, but so I I don't do that work myself. Um, but Joe and Janine are pretty confident that we should ultimately be able to get to the point that we can do that kind of identification. The tricky thing in cities is that we don't just have multiple species, but we have multiple cultivars of species. And you and a lot of those cultivars, I'm going to get in the weeds here, but are, you know, are have been developed because they have, you know, they're especially colorful. And so um, so it's a more complicated proposition than doing that for a native forest, which has much lower diversity. Um, okay, so, and then a, a third question kind of in this terrestrial realm is trying to understand the effectiveness of pollinator habitat. And so in particular, we're interested in um, the effects of both habitat fragmentation as well as bee lawns for um, influencing both local pollinator abundance, as well as whether those program, the bee lawn program in particular, which I'll talk about in a minute, can scale to actually make a difference at the level of um, the metro um, in terms of pollinator populations. So how many of you are, uh, are um, familiar with the bee lawn program? So some of you, um, so I'll go ahead and explain it. So this is a state program that funds individual homeowners to replace their turf grass lawns with pollinator friendly plantings. So here is an example, and it's a pretty new program. It just started a couple of years ago. Here's an example of um, this household. Um, they took out their turf grass lawn and they replaced it with pollinator friendly um, with pollinator friendly plantings. Um, and uh, you can see a lot of white clover in this particular um, photo. I should check this chat, I guess. Very familiar with Belon. Okay, awesome. Um, so, um, and then my next photo, I'm gonna have to go back to my, sorry, I'm not very good at, doing these two screens. Oops. Um, yeah, so here's a picture now where you can see the neighbor's lawn um, and you can see the contrast between this bee lawn and a traditional turf grass lawn. So the question is, you know, do these bee lawns make a difference in terms of insect pollinators? And so we're partnering with this program in, at, by, to actually make measurements and, and quantify the effect of these bee lawns on pollinator populations. 
Okay, so then um, we're also asking questions um, about aquatic systems. Um, so one set of questions deals with the functioning of urban watersheds. So we're interested in how the configuration and type of, of green versus gray infrastructure interacts with climate to uh, impact hydrology um, and, uh, and flood downstream flooding um, and how those effects ultimately are experienced by different groups of people. So this work is just getting underway. Um, and so this is uh, this team is, um, I haven't been telling you everybody's names, but this team is led by um, Shui Feng and Tracy Twine. Um, so here's an example of some of the work that we're just getting going. Um, this is being led by Sha Ting Chen, who's a graduate student of Shui's. And so here, what Sha Ting did was compare um, networks of green infrastructure that have different uh, network design in terms of connectivity. Um, and, and, the, and then she also looked at the percentage of, of network nodes that were um, green infrastructure um, and made some assumptions about how green infrastructure are, uh, are infiltrating water. Then she combined that with uh, hydrologic modeling using the swim model of stormwater flow and then looked at different climate scenarios and then looked at um, analyzed peak flow at the, at the outflow and then also inland flood volume. And so these are some of her results. So here we have peak flow on the top set of panels and then total inland flood volume on the bottom set of panels um, as a function of the percentage of nodes in the network that were green infrastructure. And then under different um, uh, precipitation scenarios. So uh, you know, a two-year rain event, 10-year rain event, 25, 100 year. So you can see that as you increase the number of green infrastructure nodes, that results in lower peak flow rate and flood volumes, but that green infrastructure did a more, was more effective at reducing the peak flow rate at the outlet when rainfall intensities were low, um, but was more effective at reducing the inland flooding rate um, at higher rainfall intensity. Um, and then we're also interested in understanding impacts on lakes and streams of variation and interactions between management. So things like alum treatment or um, installation of green and of, you know, BMPs to reduce um, uh, nutrient loading, climate and land use on pollutant loading, and then ultimately the um, structure and functioning of these lake ecosystems. And again, we want to pay attention to how those benefits and burdens of these aquatic systems are distributed across different um, communities in the Twin Cities. So a couple things that we're doing that may be of interest to, to you all. Um, so on the stream side of things, um, Mike Ament, who's a new postdoc on the project, um, is pulling together um, stream information for um, 20 plus watersheds where he's gathering data on hydrology and water quality um, in order to start to ask some of these questions um, about interactions between management and climate um, over time um, on water quality. And then on the lake side, um, again, we've been pulling together um, data from uh, diverse sources. And so this is work that Grace Neumuller, who is a postdoc in uh, Jacques Finlay's lab, has been working on. And here we have sort of a hierarchical um, data compilation where, you know, for a thousand lakes, we've got snapshots of water quality. For about 200 lakes, we're able to look at trends over time. For 10 lakes, then we're doing intensive modeling to try to understand those trends. And then we've got two lakes, um, Como and McCarran's, where we're doing intensive sampling, where we're trying to increase the spatial and temporal resolution, as well as the constituents that are measured um, uh, to enhance the existing data sets. Um, and then sort of moving to the social science side of things, thinking about um, decision-making, uh, Bonnie Keeler and Kate Derrickson are leading work that's looking at historically and onto the future, the coupling of urban nature investments and wealth. So, um, what, how do investments in urban nature influence community wealth? Um, and how are those benefits of urban nature in terms of wealth 
distributed across different communities. And then further, what happens when we um, have policy interventions that um, are designed to um, reduce those kinds of disparities? Like, can are they uh, are they effective? And so here's an example of um, some of the data that are going into this project. Um, so this is a map of Minneapolis and St. Paul. Um, the dark green shows parks that were um, established before 1950. So this shows one measure of investment in urban nature, so parks. And then the black areas show um, places that had racial covenants. So where there was discriminatory um, policies in place to exclude people of color from uh, buying homes in those neighborhoods. And so this is work that was done by the Mapping Prejudice Project, is being done by the Mapping Prejudice Project. So Minneapolis is complete, but the work there's work in progress for St. Paul. And then the other colors, so the light, the A, B, C, D, um, are referring to these categories that were established um, during the WPA by the Homeowners Loan Corporation. So if you've heard of the term redlining, so this was um, when neighborhoods were basically given a grade according to how risky it was perceived that, um, that investing in, and, and giving loans to people to buy homes in those neighborhoods might be. And now we know that the redlined neighborhoods were just basically neighborhoods where black people lived. Um, so you can see that there's a, a pretty close correspondence that these neighborhoods that had um, that excluded people of color essentially had greater investments in um, in uh, parks. Um, and then uh, finally on the social science side of things, we're interested in um, how cities compare in terms of the policies and practices that they have in place related to the environment so that we can try to determine um, which policies and practices lead to more effective environmental outcomes. And we're particularly interested in the role of advocacy in influencing those policies and practices. And this is work that's being led by Kristen Nelson and Forrest Fleischman. And so um, just you know, going back to what I was saying at the beginning about how we have this highly polycentric governance in the Twin Cities. So they're taking advantage of this to compare across municipalities. Um, and so these are some of the things that they're doing and looking for. So they're analyzing municipal codes and council meeting minutes to, to see whether equity, inclusion, diversity, and justice are part of the, the, the decision-making process. Um, they're looking at the types of nature and uses of nature that are emphasized. What are the, the goals for any kinds of uh, requirements, fees, uh, regulations that are in place? Um, what are the actions that have been established to meet those goals and how are they enforced? Um, and what are the governance systems and authority? And then they're also doing some in-depth case study interviews um, to look at more of the process of how policies developed and changed and what are the motivations behind those policies? And also what are the challenges that cities are facing related to urban nature? So then finally, um, sort of throughout all of this work, we're trying to emphasize an inclusive community engaged research approach. Um, so this is work that's being led by May Davenport and Shanae Matson. Um, and in this case, um, we're interested in both engaging with diverse communities, especially communities that may not have been um, kind of part of research before related to um, the urban system, um, and also on the researcher side, try to, um, to uh, establish inclusive research interventions. And I'll just give you an example of one of those in a minute, and then see how that changes partnership outcomes. So the outcomes for both the researchers as well as the community partners, um, and ultimately how it changes the nature of the research that we're doing. So this is a long-term ecological research program. So we're interested in how this process of community engagement ultimately changes the trajectory of the research that we're doing. So we're studying 
ourselves in this context over the long term um, as well. And so one of the things that we're we're doing is developing relationships with um, BIPOC communities to listen to and learn from those communities about what they, what does urban nature mean to them and what do they care about with respect to urban nature. And again, to understand how such engagement changes the nature of the research and the researchers and the community partners. And so as one example, as I said, you know, we just gotten started in this project and developing these relationships um, takes a long time um, to develop meaningful relationships. And so one of the things that we did uh, this fall was we actually took our team um, on a tour of Dakota sacred sites um, that was led by Darlene St. Clair, who's a faculty member at St. Cloud State, and she's also a, a Dakota woman. Um, so she took us to three places in the Twin Cities. Um, this is Pilot Knob or Oheawahi, which is, um, how many of you have been to Pilot Knob? So it's over just above Mendota. Um, and then we also visited Bedote, which is uh, the confluence of the Minnesota and the Mississippi and is the origin place for the Dakota people. And then we also went to Coldwater Spring, um, it, which is in Minnehaha, well, next to Minnehaha Park. Um, and the, she chose these three areas because they have very different um, governance. This is city land, um, the Bedote is state park, and then Coldwater Spring is owned by the federal government. Um, and these three different lands and those different entities have very different relationships with the Dakota people and have taken a very different approach to um, in the interpretation of these sites or not. Um, and so, um, you know, she charged us with really thinking about what it means for us to be doing all of this work on Dakota land um, and how we might use our position of privilege and, and power, um, uh, you know, as, as researchers from the university, from the academy. Um, so this is something that I think we're all grappling with and thinking about um, as we move forward, what does it mean for us to be doing all of this work on Dakota land? So then um, finally, I'll just mention some of our educational programs. So we have a schoolyard program um, at the Bell Museum. Um, and here we're aiming to provide um, middle school learners from the St. Paul and Paul Minneapolis schools with uh, field trip experiences at the Bell. Um, and also uh, to work with teachers to develop resources so that they can actually use the urban nature that is around their schools um, to engage with students around the middle school science standards. Um, so it's difficult for teachers to bring kids to the Bell Museum. Um, and I think a lot of people think, oh, well, you know, we don't really have natural areas near us. Um, but as you all know, every school has a stormwater pond, you know, within, you know, every, there's a stormwater pond everywhere, right? And so are there things that teachers could do if they had the resources available to them um, in, right in their own schoolyards? Um, so that's our aim is to work with teachers to develop those resources. Um, and then we also have um, developed partnerships with um, several undergraduate programs. So we have um, three programs that we're working with. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with Diana Dalbotton's our youth site research experience for undergraduates program in sustainable land and water resources based out of the St. Anthony Falls Lab, um, the urban studies major senior project uh, led by Kate Derrickson, and then the ESPM um, senior capstone project uh, led by Kristen Nelson. So um, I will just end by saying we have you know a website and there's a place where you can go to sign up for um, a newsletter that we hope to be developing. Um, and we, um, you know, so you think about whether this is a project that might be useful to you or that you want to engage with. Um, and if so, let me know. As I said, you know, we are developing these pretty extensive databases um, and those will be publicly available. Um, so we're trying to bring together a lot of the 
there's just an immense amount of water data in the Twin Cities, but it's not always accessible. It's buried in a PDF report, or in, it's not in a form that you can compare to this other source of data. And so we're working really hard to try to bring those disparate data sets together in ways that then can be useful to, to students like you. Um, and then I'll just end by acknowledging the team. So as I said, you know, we have 30 senior personnel and, and almost 60 participants now, so I can't thank all of them. John is part of this, um, but I'll just acknowledge that this is the work of lots and lots and lots of people. And if you are interested in any of it, I can point you to the specific individuals that um, would be appropriate. So I will stop there. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Large number of people online. I saw there's 21. Oh, wow. Online. Okay. So we'll want to look at that. Yeah. Anybody that has a question that's uh, online, please uh, text in the chat. I see you putting in some RAs. Okay, let's see. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah, the two lakes are Como and McCarran's. Um, Yep, absolutely. So those are all the kinds of data that we'll be evaluating. So we're really interested in um, in looking at interactions between climate management and and land use, land cover. Um, and so those issues will definitely be issues that you know these metrics of of land use, land cover will be things that we'll be considering. Oh. Oh yeah. So so far, I'm only answering the questions that are in the chat. So I haven't answered any questions um, from the room. So I will repeat those if there is one. Yeah, Dave. Yeah, I wanted to follow up on that question about the impervious surfaces. Um, so <clears throat> I live in uh, Brooklyn Center and it's a community that has a majority minority population. Yes, it's actually one of our focal cities for the um, governance group is gonna be doing their case Good. study at Brooklyn Center. Yeah, and I'm a, a watershed commissioner also for Shingle Creek. They um, might end up interviewing you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So one of the big um, inequities that has happened in our region is the construction of freeways. And if you look at, you showed a picture of the industrial zone in North Minneapolis, Highway 94 cuts off all of the people of color from the Mississippi River. And that goes all the way from downtown Minneapolis through uh, Brooklyn's, Brooklyn Park. Um, that is all a national park. And, um, if you look at the number of canoeists, there's a huge number of people who canoe on the river, and absolutely none of them are people of color. Yeah. And trying to get from the places where the people of color live to the Mississippi River is pretty much impossible. Yeah. Because they've been completely cut off. And right now, MnDOT is attempting to create a new highway, a new freeway between uh, North Minneapolis and Highway 610. And they want to increase the traffic by putting in a six lane freeway that would attract 22 million extra cars a year. And 22 million extra cars a year, which would draw from all the white communities around, take traffic off of them and put them onto that freeway. So, I'm part of a group that's trying to um, get men to have to change their mind on this project. And um, it's really proving very difficult because of systemic racism that exists in our state agency. So I think there's something there that also might be of an interest to yeah, the group. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know if people could hear Dave's um, comment but he was just describing um, how some of the existing freeways and then new freeways that MnDOT is planning are um, particularly uh, problematic in terms of cutting off 
communities of color from things like the the, the Mississippi River. Um, and so, yeah, that's interesting because the governance group, especially, you know, some of, and some of the grad students might be interested. So thanks for letting me know about that. Oh, good. Oh, good. So I don't have to repeat. Excellent. Um, the, um, yeah, I will just comment. Um, so one of the organizations that we started to work with is the Lower Failing Creek Project. I don't know how many of you are familiar with that, but that's a project that is um, focused on um, restoration of the the area around Wakan Tipi, um, which so is near the Bruce Bento Wildlife Refuge. And um, they're gonna be building a visitor center that's really and 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 that's really focused on um, on Dakota culture and, and the importance of that area, that place to the Dakota people. So there's a cave there, Wakan Tipi. And we went to the groundbreaking and it was one of the most striking experiences. We were underneath the about three different overpasses. The airplanes are coming off the, you know, the, the downtown airport. Um, and it was just this incredible juxtaposition of, you know, of Dakota dancing and drumming and and you know honoring this sacred place under this, you know, incredible industrial and you know transportation and then the trains oh and the trains were going by as well um so anyway oh yeah so pat is talking about lower failing creek so yeah so we're going to be connecting with them both in the pollinator work that we're doing and in some of the watershed work that we're doing um pat so one of the things that this group is doing is working on daylighting um part of failing creek so uh, the original failing creek which is currently in a storm drain. And then what we call Failing Creek is just a drainage ditch. Um, so, yeah. Other questions or comments? I have one. Yeah. I'm a neighbor to here, and so there are a lot of watershed people who work here. There's a lot of potential volunteer energy, and you may or may not. And this um, the word of your lecture went out over Lisbon. How can people who are retired, many people, or have time, they're working part time, their parents who are you know homeschooling and are managing all that. How can volunteers connect and find useful? Thing. I don't expect you to answer that offhand right now, but who, do you have a yeah. person? Yeah, or? so what I would suggest is going to our website and I can put that back up. Um, let's see. Yeah, I have to go back. Oh, wait. Sorry, I'm not very good at using the mouse on the screen that I'm not on. There we go. Um, whoops. I apologize. Oh, that's okay. So there's the web address at the top. And there are a couple of links on the website. There's one to sign up for our newsletter, our community newsletter, which we haven't put one out yet, but we will be. Um, and then there's also a place where you can just um, like leave comments. Um, like there's a comment box that you can. Um, put comments into and so we're keeping track of those. Um, so I would say either and you know sign up for the newsletter and or um, you know you can make a comment and say that you know that's something that you're interested in. Um, Great. Yeah. Could you could you use the, the person so they can understand your question? Oh the so question, sorry, I'm sorry, we all have masks on and it's hard to understand. The question was, how can people get involved if they're interested in, say, volunteering, for example? Um, that was the question. Yeah. Um, I work part time with the IMAP Creek Watershed District. Uh, I haven't heard of this before. It might just be because I'm not that high up in the staff, but I was wondering how you are communicating with the Watershed District. 
Already? Yeah, so the question was how we're communicating with the watershed district. So the group that's leading that component of the project, so uh, well, so Jacques Finlay, Shui Feng, uh, Chip Small from the University of St. Thomas have been reaching out to a number of different watershed districts and watershed management organizations. Um, and so I don't, because I haven't been doing that personally, I haven't been in communication with that watershed district, but I'm pretty sure that that they have. So it's basically, you know, building. So because all of a, a lot of the folks on the project, like John, um, and other folks have, have been working on some of these issues for a long time, um, and have developed relationships. So we're taking advantage of some of those. But then also these like Jacques been also developing relationships for a long time. So it's kind of just a one-on-one a -on -one thing, but I think one of the things that we'd like to do is, you know, start to go around to some of these organizations and let them know what we're doing. So that's something that we're hoping to do in the future. We'd like to have a little bit more results, before, you know, but, um, but yeah, we'll get there. And you have a question about when the project starts. Yeah, so it just, I forgot to mention that. So it only started in March, so we're super new um, and it's, you know, been COVID. Um, and so then it will be six years from March of 2021 when we would go up for renewal. Um, and hopefully if we're a productive site um, and we are able to, you know, show that we've done a lot of work, there's a good chance that we would be able to be renewed. Um, some of the projects in this network have been in existence with continuous funding since 1982. Um, so, you know, we're hopeful that this is something that isn't just going to be a six year project, that this could actually be, you know, something that way outlasts me and my time at the university. Um, and so, um, so we really do value building the kinds of relationships that you're talking about um, over the long term. Okay, I think that's okay. it. Thank you very much. For yeah, thanks everybody for coming. Let's uh, give Sarah another applause. <laughs>